I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this conference. It's a very nice place. I really uh, like it here. I, it's my first time as, as Jairo said, it's probably for most of us. So um, I will speak about the uh, quaint switching of antiferromagnetic copper manganese arsenide using ultra short pulses. And uh, I must say that uh, um, Alexei's uh, comments about uh, need for definition of switching means and what ultra short means is perfectly relevant for my talk. Uh, so um, here is the outline of my talk. I will first introduce what we mean by quaint switching. Uh, I will show you examples of quaint switching, uh, how that it is very strong effect, how it relates to, to the standard reorientation switching and uh, I will show you examples that we can achieve the switching also with uh, very short optical pulses. And uh, then in uh, attempt to understand what, what is happening during coin switching, I will uh, also comment the atomically sharp domain walls which we observe in copper manganese arsenide. And then uh, uh, I will speak about the temperature dependent relaxation we observe of the coin switching signal we observe, which is quite uh, in interesting and important. And uh, Eventually, in the end, I will conclude with some with some uh, uh, with the functionality of our devices, which might have some uh, might be interesting for applications. So uh, we are working with uh, copper manganese arsenide. It's a tetragonal. It has tetragonal structure. It's antiferromagnet with no temperature, 480 Kelvin. So we can do most of our experiments at room temperature, or we do most of our experiments at room temperature. Uh, we grow the, the material on uh, gallium, uh, on, on semiconductor substrates. Uh, it grows best on gallium phosphide where we have best crystal matching so we can get really nice crystal quality, but it can be also prepared on uh, gallium arsenide or silicon where the quality is a little bit lower, but all the main features, uh, the functionality features are very similar. Um, uh, we originally studied uh, uh, the, the, the reorientation switching in, in copper manganese arsenide. Uh, copper man manganese arsenide has this spe special symmetry where the uh, uh, inversion uh, symmetry is broken by, by magnetic order. So we have the Nelson orbit torques. So simply by application of electrical current, we can reorient uh, domains uh, by 90 degrees. Here we have uh, Beam image. This is the nicest experiment uh, done in this direction, which I uh, which I like a lot. It's from the Nottingham Group. Uh, where by application of electrical current, we reverse a large domain, uh, which is here in the center. Here we have white domain. Here it changes to black, then back to white, and back to black one. So by application of electrical current, we can reverse the orientation of moments of of, of L vector. Uh, it is accompanied by change of electrical resistivity, which is uh, of the order of AMR, so it's quite small, like uh, tens of percent. And uh, when we are studying this effect, and uh, this study of this effect would exactly lead to the to the to the, to, um, to the uh, stuff which Alexei was introducing in in, in the introduction. Uh, we uh, found a new effect, additional one. It turned out that when we apply very strong pulses, we start to see really large resistivity changes, two hundred uh, to two orders of magnitude stronger, and these changes are uh, connected with uh, a dramatic change of uh, magnetic state. We change the, the state of the uh, of the uh, of, of the film from large domain states to to um, uh, tiny domains to uh, nanotextured magnetic state, and. Uh, Okay, so uh, the experiment is relatively simple. We simply have a hole bar uh, through which we send writing pulse, and then we measure the resistivity of the device. And uh, so here are some examples. When we apply the pulse, the resistivity increases, in this case, by 20%, basically from 40 ohms to 48 ohms. And then in uh, uh, three minutes or so, the, the, the resistivity relaxes back towards its initial value when we can repeat this as many times as we like. And uh, so uh, this looks promising as a, as a memory uh, device. Uh, uh, the 
Resistivity change depends on the amplitude of the writing pulse. So when we are increasing the pulse uh, intensity, there is nothing happening, nothing happening. Uh, please note that there is 0.8 here. So it means zero is somewhere here. So there is really nothing, 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 nothing. And then all of a sudden we have this onset of this effect. And when we change the amplitude of the pulse here in this region, we are quickly uh, increasing the, the amplitude of the effect. And uh, when we cool down the, 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 the system, we can measure the resistivity uh, uh, difference due, due to the uh, switching. And we can see that the difference is actually keep, uh, stays constant when we are reducing temperature, uh, while the uh, resistivity itself goes down to a residual value. So at low temperatures, actually the, the resistivity difference induced by coin switching is reaches 100%. And uh, that is just by coincidence or, or independently, there was published a paper on uh, resistivity of copper manganese arsenide where it was theoretically predicted or <laughs> stated, I would say, that uh, the um, if, if you choose some reasonable uh, um, defects in a material, to, to get the correct residual uh, residual resistance, you can indeed expect that if you, that uh, the difference between fully uh, uh, between antiferromagnetically ordered copper man uh, resistance of antiferromagnetically copper uh, um, antiferromagnetically ordered copper manganese arsenide is uh, basically half to the resistance of uh, paramagnetic uh, frozen uh, state. So. Basically, what this tells us that, uh, uh, that such a resistivity difference could be uh, uh, induced by a really dramatic magnetic disorder or, or nanotexturing. Uh, okay, so how the coin switching works? Uh, we, during the electrical pulses, which are 100 microseconds long, we can easily monitor the resistivity of the device. And if we do so, we see that the resistivity increases by let's say factor of three when we really get strong switching. And when we compare this with uh, temperature dependence of res resistance, we find out that, that the uh, temperature of the device during the switching actually reaches basically null temperature. So what we do with the pulsing is that we quickly warm up the sample to null temperature. And then when the pulse ends, we freeze the, the system very quickly back to the working temperature. And that's why we call it coin switching because we basically, for the switching, it's important to first de deliver the energy and then to quickly take it away to, to, to effectively switch, um, uh, quench the, the disordered state. And uh, uh, it turns out that it's not really important how fast, how long the pulses are, or it is in sense, but in another not. Uh, if we study the, 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 the pulses in the nanosecond range, uh, it turns out that when we are going down to nanos one nanosecond, we are reducing the energy in a pulse, which basically, which is caused by the thing that the, the time scale on which the heat can dissipate away from the film is on a nanosecond uh, scale. So basically if the pulse is one nanosecond or shorter, uh, we don't have to calculate the, the heat which escapes during the pulse. And we really know that if we deliver the, 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 that heat within one nanosecond, we will reach null temperature. And uh, so uh, this is the, the, the case for uh, um, electrical pulses where we can calculate the energy by current and, and resistivity from current and resistivity. But it's also the case for optical pulses, which can be as short as, as 100 femtosecond, where we simply measure the uh, absorbed energy. And it turns out that the two numbers are really uh, very similar, 2.6 kilojoules. And here it's from two to three kilojoules. Uh, so uh, yeah, we can induce this, uh, uh, the, the coin switching effect by any pulse, which simply delivers enough energy. And it needs to be short enough so that the cooling process is fast enough, I would say. Yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and we know how, how quickly the uh, uh, heat is dissipating away from the, from the system for, from pump and probe experiments in which we can measure the, the change in reflectivity on a sub-nanosecond time scale. 
yeah, and then for thinner samples, it's faster, and for thicker samples, it's getting to uh, over one nanosecond, let's say. But the characteristic time scale on which it, the, the, the heat dissipation uh, happens. So we understand this thing that we uh, um, shatter basically the, the, the large magnetic state, the large domain state to, to disordered state. But there is one problem, uh, and, and we documented it by three independent uh, visualization techniques by XMLD beam with NV center diamond magnetometry and this magneto Zebek method. Uh, but there is a problem. We know from beam experiment that the micromagnetic domain wall width is about 100 nanometers. And this, uh, uh, this quaint switched disordered state actually has uh, features which are smaller than resolution of the technique, which is about 10 nanometers. So uh, it means something, some unexpected physics must be, must be happening. Uh, and that's why I have here this uh, uh, part about atomically sharp domain walls. Uh, but with, before I show you them, I want to show you another experiment uh, from, from the Nottingham uh, uh, group, where we have, uh, in PIM, we can observe this, uh, this large uh, uh, domains in copper manganese arsenide. We have this black one, which has horizontal spin axis, white one, which has uh, vertical spin axis. And uh, uh, when we rotate the beam direction by 45 degrees, we uh, actually shift the focus from domains to domain walls. And so this is the image from which one can infer the, the width of the domain wall. And uh, so we have basically information about spin direction or spin axis inside the domain, uh, inside domains and also uh, in the domain walls. And uh, uh, there is this specific place where the domain wall actually changes color. And if we do here a small exercise, which is that we follow the, that we mark one of the sublattices, let's say this, let's say the yellow one is sublattice A, and we go over the domain wall, we, we can see that the, 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 the spin axis rotates uh, counterclockwise to left, from up to left, then on this white domain wall, it rotates again counterclockwise to down, and we end up inside the same domain here in a, in a nice, nice wide region where there should be no magnetic features. We end up with a spin in opposite direction. So it, this, this is telling us that something must happen inside uh, of, of the uh, domain, uh, which is invisible for PIM, and that's, um, and we call it invisible domain walls. And, uh, uh, This was puzzle. There is a uh, um, experiment in, vi in, which, in, vi in which we took a nice piece of uh, copper manganese arsenide, uh, where we have uh, a cut. Uh, we have cut lamella from it, which has thickness of 50 to 100 nanometers. So it, it is. It, it, each of the points represent basically 100 atoms, column of 100 atoms, and uh, normally one would use this uh, half detector, which measures the intensity of scattered electrons. So you basically measure mass of the, of the atoms in the column. But people also use DPC detector, which measures the devi angular deviation of electrons which are passing through the structure. And uh, this is used to study magnetic contrast, but normally it's used to study magnetic contrast on macroscopic domains, which uh, uh, which have magnetic field inside them. And this magnetic field acts uh, through uh, Lorentz force on the beam and it deflects it. So you can visualize magnetic domains. But we were thinking that since we have all the magnetic, uh, all the atoms in, in the column have the same magnetic moment, we could see uh, deflection on these atoms. And it turned out that really we can see uh, uh, such uh, domains and uh, or we can see the magnetic order and, and actually we can see atomically sharp transitions from one domain side to the other domain side. And uh, yeah, this is the same place. So we see no distortion in the, in the crystal. There are, we see this, uh, this is surprising results, which uh, on its own would be um, puzzling <laughs> enough and, and uh, controversial enough. Uh, but we really could not find any 
reasonable explanation for the signal. And we even uh, got actually dynamic diffraction calculations, which are consistent. With when the dynamic diffraction is extremely sensitive to a large number of parameters, but it's relatively straightforward to find parameters in which such contrast can, uh, can, can appear. And so basically we have uh, four puzzles, right? We have, uh, or yeah, we have the puzzle of atomically sharp domain wall or like surprising result of atomically sharp domain wall. We have this uh, topologic spin axis topology puzzle. We have the, the question why the uh, uh, nano textured state is, is so stable, why it doesn't relax much faster and uh, uh, why we can have such a huge resistivity change in the material. And actually, if we combine it together, it makes sense. We basically stabilize the, the uh, nano texture state by presence of features like uh, atomically sharp domain walls. And uh, that's why we can observe that high resistivity signals. And uh, now, how is it possible that the uh, uh, atomically sharp domain walls, which are in micromagnetic calculation meaningless, uh, are possible. Uh, it turns out that if we use ab initio calculation and, and calculate the energy of, uh, of domain wall as a function of its width or as a function or on this axis, we have the angle between spins on the neighboring atoms inside the domain wall. So 180 means that we have the atomically sharp domain wall degrees, uh, nine three steps and so on. So the semi-classical Heisenberg exchange mo model would say that it should be homogeneous and it would be basically sinusoidal. And uh, if we do the calculations for iron, we indeed get something homogeneous. Uh, no one expects that this Heisenberg model will work perfectly, but at least it should be homogeneous. But in copper manganese arsenide, the situation is definitely not that simple. Uh, uh, the, 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 the calculation is far from smooth or the, the results are far for, from smooth. So one can even, one could even sort of happily uh, <laughs> say that we have energy minimum here on the atomically sharp configuration. I would not say it's, it's exactly the, the proof that this is, this is correct interpretation, but definitely it means that there can be some um, configurations which have lower energy which 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 has, which are uh, sitting in energy minimum, and so uh, the system can be uh, the relaxation uh, or, or the system can be trapped in this energy minima, and uh, which would slow down the, the the relaxation, the growth of large domains. And uh, I think it's important to 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 stress this last point that. Uh, uh, I think to, to have this non-trivial dependency, you don't need antiferromagnet. You probably need uh, material which has a lot of atoms, different sides and, and different atomic species. And uh, so the fact that iron is going smoothly, it's most likely just because it's, it's just single element crystal. While here we have uh, complex, uh, uh, in copper manganese arsenide, we have complex uh, uh, unit cell, right? And uh, so, so in other in, in uh, other more complex ferromagnets, I would expect that this also can be quite complicated. The energy landscape could be quite complicated, but we didn't discover coin switching in those materials before, and I think that's because the coin switching will be uh, obscured in ferromagnets because any domain inside ferromagnet is is uh, uh, emanating magnetic field via the polar interaction, and this magnetic field will immediately switch the neighboring domains. So such a state would be in ferromagnets actually erased very quickly or, or yeah, it will, it, it will be, um, the, the domain growth in ferromagnets will be accelerated by this dipolar interaction. And even just the switching induced by the magnetic field will, will be happening. Well, in antiferromagnet, this long range interaction is missing and that's why the, uh, this metastable state can be much more stable. Uh, and uh, now we are, yeah, so I think these calculations just 
in with these calculations, or, uh, I rather intend to say that maybe we just don't understand properly enough the, the antiferromagnetic state of copper manganese arsenide. We, we are far from understanding uh, even the atomically sharp domain wall, and especially we are very far from understanding this, this state as a whole and its dynamics. But we can actually learn a lot about its dynamics from temperature dependency. Yeah, okay. So I will just finish this last slide. So this, uh, uh, we can, I've shown you that the, 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 the signal relaxes and uh, the uh, relaxation is getting, is actually, uh, can be uh, that uh, characterized by the stretch exponential function where uh, we just have this uh, exponent in time, which corresponds to complex 3D interacting system, which makes sense because we have these small domains which are interacting. And uh, when we cool down the system from room temperature down to 230 kelvins, the process gets basically 10,000 times slower. And uh, there is uh, additional complication as, as always. There is a, another component which appears when we cool down, uh, which is about 1,000 times faster. So we have two components which, which behave basically, but it can also be fitted by, by, by the same function. And if we plot these uh, relaxation times, which we obtain from these fits uh, uh, in the plot with inverse temperature, we get quite nice uh, lines. Uh, and uh, these lines actually indicate uh, that uh, uh, when we go to t over uh, one over t uh, equals zero, we get the characteristic time of the, of, of the underlying processes. And it turns out that both of the components are uh, terahertz regime. From this, we can say that the which is uh, allowing the, the, the growth of the domains is, uh, is governed by the antiferromagnetic dynamics. So I would say here, this I added after the introduction, that uh, I cannot say that we observe ultra fast writing at all from the experiments which I have shown you, but from this experiment, I can say that uh, we observe ultra fast relaxation and it's actually exactly the inverse of the process which we want to do. We want to coherently switch the state by these processes from, from one state to another. And this is, here we observe the randomization, the other side of, of, of such a writing. Yeah, and if I don't have time, I can skip functionality. <laughs> 